Proverbs 25, 28, like a city whose walls are broken down is a man who lacks self-control. In the Old Testament, the walls of a city are the protection of that city. And not just from men, but from animals as well. Do you want to protect yourself? Then wall yourself in brick by brick with self-control. Hello and welcome. You're listening to sermons from the audio archives of Christian counselor and speaker George Stenke. We hope you enjoy these sermons that are full of practical wisdom and solid truth to help you grow in your relationship with Christ. Keep listening after the sermon for more information about George Stenke and the resources available to you from Renewal Ministries. So by the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we trust you will be blessed as you listen to this selection from the archives of George Stenke. 2 Peter chapter 1, what we're talking about is the importance of adding to our faith. I mean, it's great to have a saving faith in Jesus Christ, and isn't that where it starts? But there, including that step, there are eight essential steps, eight building blocks that will ensure our effectiveness, our productivity, and dare I say, our longevity in Christ. Last week we talked about Saul. Solomon. Good, you are, you are listening. Talked about Solomon. You know, he started strong, but he finished poorly. Very few of the men and women that we read about in Scripture finished well. There was productivity for a time, there was fruitfulness for a time, but when the dust settled, they weren't to be seen. And even even in the case of Samson, where Samson was called of God, a tremendous story, Samson was called of God, and he was called with purpose and destiny, but because he lacked self-control, he suffered humiliation, physical torment, his eyes being gouged from his head, being taunted by his captors. And even in his later years, as his hair began to grow back, and with the growing of his hair, the strength of God coming back on, and at the same time, there was a repentance where he recognized that he had sinned, and he begged God for one last opportunity to serve. And in that one opportunity that God in his mercy gave him, he did serve and he did accomplish God's purpose but his life ended. And when we think about the importance, I mean, why is it, why is it that Paul, and who we're going to look at this morning, is, is the Apostle Paul. Why is self-control so critical? We can look at Samson and answer that question very easily. You know, Samson and Delilah was a situation where Delilah was set specifically to snare him, and he had no control. I mean, he just wanted Delilah. Even though he knew what Delilah's intent was, and he had to have known, he was blinded. He was so blinded by the deceitfulness of his own sin, which came about as a lack of his self-control, that when his head was shaved, And Delilah said, Samson, rise, for the Philistines are upon you. The scripture records that he said these words in his heart. I will rise as I have in times past and win the victory. But he did not know that God had departed from him. When there is a lack of self-control, and and we see it in, in the church, we see it in Christians. You know, Christians, that man, they can rise up like Samson. I mean, they, they can be in, in, in sin one minute, and they can be giving a prophecy the next. 
When we did our study on the gifts of the Spirit, do you remember what we said? The fact that someone is used by God does not mean that it is God's stamp of approval on their life. Just because someone is used by the Lord doesn't mean that God has blinders on and is unable to see the condition of their heart. God will use anybody that will say, here I am, use me. He's used alcoholics to preach the gospel where tens of thousands have gotten saved. There have been preachers that have passed your churches that have died of AIDS. We could just go on and on and on. The scripture says, add to your faith self-control. What is self-control? <coughs> Excuse me. In the Greek, the literal rendering of self-control is the virtue of one who masters his desires and passions, especially his sensual appetites. Desire, passion, an appetite. God is saying through his servant Paul to you and I, if you want to stand the tests of this world, if you want to inherit the kingdom of God, then you must do everything in your ability to add in an increased measure self-control. You must control your desire, your passion, and your appetite or you will not be fruitful, you will not be productive, and when the test comes, you will not stand. These are sobering words. Titus 2.11 in the New Living Translation says this, For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people, and we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with self-control, right conduct and devotion to God. In the Apocrypha, there is a book called Sirach, and in chapter 18, verses 30 through 33, I want to read these words because they are very good thoughts. It says, do not follow your base desires, but restrain your appetites. If you allow your soul to take pleasure in base desire, it will make you a laughing stock to all of your enemies. And this is what happened to Samson. He became a laughing stock. Verse 32, do not revel in great luxury, or you may become impoverished by its expense. Do not become a beggar by feasting with borrowed money when you have nothing in your purse. Add to your faith the control of your desires, your passion, and your appetites. Now where does it start? Turn to James chapter 3. This is where self-control starts. Now understand that the scripture says that we are to make every effort. And, and, and I just, I really want to emphasize the, the reason. You, I mean, you could be hearing this, this message and think, man, does he ever preach on anything that is uplifting? I mean, it's like this series has been nothing but a sledgehammer across the temple. But if that is the case, then you're missing the point of the whole series. God wants us to be fruitful and productive and able to stand, and that is a powerful testimony. Is there anybody here that just would be content to be a spiritual couch potato? Does, any, does anybody here want to conquer something for God? Do you want some adventure? I mean, do you want to be challenged? And then do you want to see by the power of the Holy Spirit success in your life and whatever that challenge may be? Are you just content? You know, I'll just come to church, punch in my time card, put in my time, go home, just like I do at work. Surely that's not how you go to work. (laughs) 
do you want to achieve greatness? Do you want to be able to close your eyes at the end of the day with a heavy sigh and say, praise God, that was a great day. <laughs> in spite of the circumstances that may have come your way, being able to, to, to lay down on your bed and be glad with what you were able to achieve understanding that someday we will stand before God Almighty and He will pass out rewards to us. And the scripture does say that the rewards are very different. Now I don't understand how they're different because the scripture doesn't tell us, but we don't just all get an attaboy and a slap on the back. There are rewards that are different. And those rewards are determined to a large degree by the amount of self-control that we've been able to exercise in our lives, thus making us more productive and fruitful for the kingdom of God. Here's where it starts. With what you say. If you can control what comes out of your mouth, the scripture says you can control everything else in your life. Now, that is such a huge scripture. That is so powerful. Let's read it. James 3, starting in verse 2. This is in the New Living Translation. We all make many mistakes, but those who control their tongues can also control themselves in every other way. I don't know about you, but I read that, and it's like, man... That's like saying I could raise the dead. Like I could go out and perform miracles, turn water into wine, walk on water. I mean, you're saying if I can control my tongue, that I can control every other aspect of my life, all of my desires, all of my passions, that I can control it all? Now, let me ask you a question. Just think for a minute, what is it in your life that is out of control? What desire? You know, you, it, it's good to desire to be successful. We did a whole series on God's desire for us to be successful. But if that gets out of control where you are so driven to be a success that you forfeit your family, then you've lost if you end up with the presidency. There has to be control in all things. What is it in your life that needs to come under a greater degree of control? Now, while you're pondering that, let me throw out something to you. Something I believe based on this scripture and others like it. If I cannot control what comes out of my mouth, that is an indication that there are other areas in my life that are also out of control, whether seen or unseen. Jesus said, you will know a tree by its fruit. Because a good tree cannot produce bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. And what is the fruit that is the most visible, the most evident? Isn't it our words? You know, we're nailing on a board and we miss like we so often do. I hope that hasn't been your plight, Jim. <clears throat> All that remodeling. We smack our hand and what is it that comes out of our mouth? Understand this, the scripture says that we speak from the abundance that is in our hearts. When you say something that you regret, and then you say, oh, I didn't mean that, you need to, you need to understand that it's not a, you didn't intend to say it, but you did mean it. There is a difference. We didn't intend to say that. We, we didn't mean to make that slip to expose what's in our heart. But oops, it is out. And so now it's the great cover-up. I submit to you that if you see someone who cannot control what comes out of their mouth, you're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. You're, you're, you're just seeing the tip of the iceberg and there is something under the surface that is so huge and so out of control and you've just been given a small hint. Is that what the scripture says? Am, am, I, taking, am I making too much out of this? Jesus is saying to us through his servant Paul, 
add to your faith control. You cannot say everything that comes to your mind. You cannot. And if you can begin to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ so that your words are in keeping with Scripture, if you can do that, then you can master the problem with lust. You can master the problem with exaggeration. Nicer word than lying. You can master the... Pr whatever your problem is, you can master it if you can simply master what comes out of your mouth. Wow. That is a huge promise. That's awesome. yeah, it is. I mean, that, that is pretty huge. Yeah, it is. And it really puts things into perspective, doesn't it? I won't even go on to, to uh, read the rest of that scripture. Proverbs 13 and verse 3, He who guards his lips guards his life, but he who speaks rashly will come to ruin. Now how, how, how can, what are, because what are, we want to put a handle on this self-control thing, so what is a way in which I can begin to exercise self-control? Here's, here's a simple one. Learn how to say no. Seriously, learn how to say no. Because if you, if you commit yourself to do something, then you are bound to follow through with that commitment. And, and we are to exercise self-control in all of our desires. You know, we have a desire to help all kinds of people. But there are times when our desire is beyond our ability or our capacity. And so learning how to say no is a really important thing in learning how to exercise self-control. Now other people get bent out of shape about that because the need is so huge. But you know your limitations, you know your capacity, and knowing how to say no is a great start. Because then you don't have to come up with a lot of excuses as to why you couldn't fulfill your promise. Or in the midst of fulfilling your promise, you don't have to come up with a lot of excuses because your attitude is rotten. <laughs> Does that make sense? Sure. The scripture is so simple, really. It is so simple. If you guard your lips, you guard your life. If you refuse to exercise self-control on how you speak, is it safe to say that you sink your own ship? That you torpedo your life? Proverbs 25, 28, like a city whose walls are broken down is a man who lacks self-control. In the Old Testament, the walls of a city are the protection of that city. And not just from men, but from animals as well. Do you want to protect yourself? Then wall yourself in brick by brick with self-control. Learn how to control your appetites. Moderation in all things is good. If your appetite for food is getting the better of you, if that's where you're out of, out of control, then simply learn to say no. There are things that you can do to begin putting on self-control. Cut the portion in half, put it in a box. You know, they deliver it, you're at their restaurant, they sit that thing down, you know you're gonna be tempted to go out of control. She sits it down and you say, ma'am, this may be a strange request, but could you go ahead and bring me a doggy bag? Well, I've never had anyone ask for a doggy bag at the beginning of the meal. Well, you see, I'm, I'm learning how to exercise self-control. So I'm going to go ahead and take half of this and put it in a box right now. And I'm going to eat the other half and be completely satisfied and have a second meal for tomorrow. There, you know, there are practical ways to do this. It's not some mystical thing out there that we just can't get a handle on, can't control. We exercise self-control. <clears throat> if we don't, then we endanger ourselves and those that we love. Paul understood the importance of self-control. In uh, Turn to Acts 24. Acts 24. And I'll start reading in verse 24. <laughs> it 
that's an amazing scripture. I mean, can you imagine? Here you are, you're falsely accused. Now, Paul has broken no laws. Paul's a man that loves God, loves the church, he's fervent, and he's in jail, he's in prison. And Felix, you know, he's had his accusers come, and his accusers have had the ear of Felix, and they said, you know, here's, all, here, here's what we've got against Paul. Man, he's, he's doing this, and he's saying we should break our laws, and, and you know, he's even saying we should break Roman law, and, you know, and they're just accusing him, just, just going nuts. And so Felix wants to hear Paul now. Paul has the opportunity to go ahead and make his defense. So Paul comes before Felix in verse 24. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewish, a Jewess, a Jewish woman. <laughs> he sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ. As Paul discoursed on righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. You can leave. When I find it convenient, I'll send for you again. He's talking about his faith in Christ, righteousness, and self-control. Now, no doubt... Felix got real uncomfortable with that self-control part because he was a man out of control. And then he talked about judgment to come. And it says Felix was afraid. And we should be afraid. There is a judgment to come where we will stand before God the Father and we will be answerable, the scripture says, for every word that has come out of our mouth, we will have to give an account. And if we have to give an account for our words, it stands to reason that we will also have to give an account for our actions. And Paul understands this. Felix is, is open to the gospel. So he's, he said, you know, I'm not just going to tell him about how to get saved. How to get saved is great. But man, if you want to get saved, if you want to stay saved, if you want to stand the test of time, Felix, you've got to understand this thing about self-control. Just because you're in a place of power, in a position of authority, doesn't mean you can just do and say anything that just comes to your mind. The pagans do that. The Christians do not. We don't live the way the rest of the world lives. We don't take every liberty that comes to us because it is simply there for us. We exercise self-control because we understand that there is a God in whom we will have to give an account. Romans 6. Verses 11 through 14, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to Christ. How do we put on self-control? How, how do we do that? How, how do we control the words that come out of our mouth? How do we build up the wall of protection? How do we make sure that that rudder is steering us in the right direction? How do we do these things? Paul says in Romans 6, verse 11, count yourself as a dead man. A dead man doesn't have rights. So when someone sins against you, you don't have the right to get out of control and punch him in the face. Or throw them a finger going down Academy Boulevard with your little Jesus bumper sticker on the back. <laughs> you know, when we get out of control is when someone just Presses us on our rights. Paul said, just remember that you're dead. You know, if you go to a funeral, and, I, and I don't, I'm not trying to be coarse or anything, but how many times have you walked across someone's grave? I mean, stood right on top of them. Do you ever get rebuked for that? Do you ever see this little, hear this little voice coming? Will you please get off of me? You're standing on my tomb. I mean, it was just silence. It was almost as though there was nothing there but just manicured grass. 
You could even wipe your feet on that old grave. And there's no response. Amazing how responsive we are, isn't it? For dead people. Amazing how quick we are to be, to, to feel the need to defend ourselves. When someone says, says something against us, whether it's true or false, doesn't make any difference. They just, they just shouldn't say anything. <laughs> I've had this experience. I don't like it any more than anybody else does. There are times when I am appalled at just how alive I am. <laughs> For a dead man, I am awfully sensitive. <laughs> how about you? How do we put on self-control? The first thing we've got to do is remember that we are supposed to be dead. Dead to the sinful nature. It is so touchy, so easily stirred. 1 Corinthians 6.12, and this, this is the scripture of a man who really understands self-control. He says, everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. This is a man who understands self-control. This is a guy who has been lied about, beaten up, shipwrecked. This is a man who has suffered at the hands of the religious folk and those outside of the church. This is the guy, well, who is this Paul? Let, let's just review here. Um, he was a persecutor of the church, and now he's a preacher of Christ. He preached throughout the entire Roman Empire, was on three extensive missionary trips. He wrote a vast portion of the New Testament. He was never afraid to face an issue head on and deal with it. He was sensitive to God's leading, and despite his strong personality, which he did have quite a personality, he was always yielded to God in the end. This Paul is the guy who says, you know, there's nothing that is not legal for me to do. I mean, he understood being a Jew, because of grace that he now lived in, that he, if he wanted to eat, have a pork sandwich, he could have a pork sandwich. If he wanted to exercise his rights, he could exercise those rights, but he, Paul had a mindset of one who understood what it was to add to your faith self-control so that others would not stumble, not just so that he would preserve himself, but so other people wouldn't stumble. Everything is permissible, but not everything benefits me. You know, I can turn on the TV, I can watch whatever I want, but you know, it's not everything that comes across that tube that's beneficial. So I'm going to exercise a little self-control. I'm not, you know what we did? We went down and we bought a box that takes all the cussing out. Well, most of it. What's that thing called? TV Guardian. TV Guardian, yeah. If you don't have a TV Guardian, you know, it's about 90 bucks. It's a lot of money. But it's so much better than listening to four-letter words. You know, I mean... It's just a way of, be, of, of exercising some self-control with technology. I am so glad we got that thing. And it wasn't because we had an extra hundred bucks lying around that we just couldn't figure out what to do with. <laughs> it's like, I, you know, it's just burning a hole in my pocket. What, what can we do with all this extra money we've got? Oh, I know. Exercise some self-control for Pete's sake. I'll get off of that one before I start meddling even more. <clears throat> First Corinthians 9, 26 and 27. This is in the message. Paul is a man who wants to finish. Now understand, Paul's been around the church. He's been playing the church game for a long time. 
He's worked with the best and the brightest. He's seen them come. He's seen them go. And Paul is the man. He says that he's not like the super apostles. I mean, he does have some humility. But for those of us that are reading all the stuff that he wrote after his death, we think like he is the super apostle here. And these are his words. Likening self-control to, to a race, to competition. He says, I don't know about you, but I am running hard for the finish line. I'm giving it everything I've got. No sloppy living for me. I'm staying alert and in top condition. I'm not going to get caught napping, telling everyone else about it, and then missing out myself. If you don't exercise self-control, you are tearing the wall of protection. by brick. And when there is no wall of protection, there is every opportunity for the schemes of the enemy, for the darts to go through and to pierce you. We need protection. We need to be putting up bigger walls, thicker walls, not tearing those walls down. We need to get serious about building hedges of protection around our family. That's why we as parents put upon our children limits of self-control. Because they haven't learned how to do it themselves yet. Which is why they have curfews, even at 21 years old. <laughs> because we are helping the next generation to help themselves because I mean do you really like spinach I mean I do but most people hate it you know there are people that just hate the things that are good for them yuck but it's eating those things that are good for us to keep us physically fit and strong it's exercising self control that not only saves us but saves someone else as well Now here's the good news. Well, actually, I'll, I'll get to the good news in a minute. I want to give you, I want to show you a life that has no self-control. It's in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. And we're going to read these scriptures, and there will be people just start coming to your mind. Yep, that's a person with no self-control. That's a person with no self-control. Oh, he just mentioned me. When you follow your desires, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, and the only way to do that is to throw out self-control, your lives will produce these evil results. Sexual immorality, impure thoughts, an eagerness for lustful pleasure, idolatry, participation in demonic activities, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, divisions, the feeling that everyone is wrong except those in your own little group, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other kinds of sin. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. A person that lives that kind of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I remember running down to that altar and weeping and having a spiritual experience. And once saved, always saved. And we quote all these scriptures about we're engraved in the palm of God's hand. And if 
as I've told you before, and now I'm telling you again, if you live a life like this, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. I've told you this before, and I'm telling you again to emphasize the point that if you do not add self-control to your faith in Jesus Christ, you will not stand. But I thought faith in Jesus was all that I needed. That's true if you're the thief on the cross about to die. That is absolutely true. Life is over for you. No more tests. No more trials. Who cares what happens tomorrow because I'll be six foot under. I don't have to get baptized in water. I don't have to get baptized in the Holy Spirit, which is a funny kind of a doctrine that if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved to begin with. I don't have to do this. I don't have to do that. That's true. If the moment you get saved, somebody puts a 45 to your head and says, now let me take you to heaven. For those of us who live in America, for those of us that have every freedom imaginable, every temptation just knocking on our door with a demand to have entrance into our lives, for those of us that live on planet Earth here, we had better add some self-control to our faith. Or we will not survive. That is what the scripture says. Here's the good news if we keep reading in verses 22 and 23. Praise God for the Holy Spirit. Praise God for the Holy Spirit. Because I don't know about you, I am trying to add these things to my faith. And there are times when I hit the ball clear over the fence and I just trot around to all the bases, smiling at the people in the stands. And there are times when I get up to bat and I swing strike one. All right, Holy Spirit, all right, this is it. And I swing a second time and it's strike two. If we could do it all in our flesh, then we wouldn't need the person of the Holy Spirit. But we can't. But when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, He will produce this kind of fruit in us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You know, there we can debate what percentage is the Holy Spirit and what, what percentage is ours? And some people do. Here's the safe bet right here. You work as though it all depends on you. And you pray as though it all depends on God. And as that fruit is more perfectly formed in you, just recognize that it is the product of the Holy Spirit. We are in a divine partnership. Those of you that, that go to this church, you have probably heard me say that so many times. It's like, he can preach a sermon on ice cream and come back and say we are in a divine partnership. How does he do that? We are in a partnership. And we've got some Christians who are content to just let the Holy Spirit do it all. And you, you can spot them because they're running to this meeting and to that meeting. And I just need another word of prophecy. I just need, you know, heavens to Betsy. We don't need another meeting. We don't need another prophecy. We don't need somebody to lay hands on us so that we fall out. We need to work. We need to get serious about the things of God. We need to roll up our sleeves and say, Holy Spirit, 
Help me today to exercise control over my desire to get ahead. Over my desire, over my passion. You know, I'm so passionate about evangelism and I don't see people evangelizing and get so mad at Christians I can just spit. Help me put on self-control and just get more people saved and let you deal with those lazy people out there. I don't know, whatever your passion may be. <laughs> submit your passion, submit your drive to God, and submit your sexual appetite to the Lord. And this is where most people fall. There is no reason for us not to live holy lives. Absolutely no reason at all. If we do not live lives that are pleasing to the Lord, it is because we are not adding to our faith in every effort. And I can't say it any plainer than that. I want you to be productive. I want you to be the most profitable people on the earth. I want you to be able to stand when the trials come, and they will. When sin comes knocking on your door, and it will. I want you to be so in control. I want you, when someone says something to you, so when somebody lies about you, when, so, when a situation rises up where you, you can speak such pure words, instead of cursing, you bless. I want people to know when, when, they say the, when they say your name, oh, man, Luke Billington, there's a guy with self-control. Whoa. Bill, oh, self-control, man. I think of Bill, it's like self-control. There's a guy that is profitable for the kingdom. Oh, I want to be profitable. Let's get serious about adding to our faith. Amen? Praise God. George Stanky is the founder and director of Renewal Ministries of Colorado Springs and has been serving in ministry for over 30 years, serving 14 of those years as a senior pastor. He's also traveled to Europe and Asia, ministering to missionaries and native pastors, as well as teaching and preaching the Word of God. George also provides counseling on a variety of individual and family-related topics, such as crisis intervention in marriages, parenting, church relations, internet pornography, trauma, grief, and more. For more information about George Stanky and Renewal Ministry, simply log on to RenewalCS.org. That's RenewalCS.org.